All right, hello there. Uh, I'm going to sit down with you guys so I can see what we're looking at. Sorry, Sorry sir. Sorry, sir. <laughs> well, uh, the three pictures I have chose all have to do with a book I'm writing about this guy. Do you know who this is? I do. Yeah, they're using this picture now in ads, I see. But this is a marvelous, uh, ambiguous picture where he's, he posed marvelously. The guy was, I knew him. And let me tell you, he was a great wit and very intelligent, quite kind, but inclined to explosions. Uh, so here he is in about 53. I think this illustrated Emmett Watson's, one of Emmett Watson's several columns about him. Let's go to the next one, because I think my time's about up. <laughs> uh, here's a group <laughs> that visited uh, for a party. Come on, have a seat here. Who visited at a party at the... Uh, uh, at uh, Ivor's place, uh, and it includes uh, the fam a couple famous people. In the back is Tom Wolfe, the novelist. And then on the far left is James Stevens, the uh, wonderful wit, and also the, the uh, Paul Bunyan story guy. Poet next to him, I don't remember his name. Below him is somebody's mother, I don't remember her name. <laughs> Teresa Stevens. Teresa. Teresa Stevens is next in the middle there. Uh, a, a commanding woman, and next to her, the, the little guy there with a cigarette is Ivor. In front of him is his wife, Maggie, who is uh, radical in every way and in everything. And then to her, or to, uh, to her right, uh, as we see it, was, uh, was Ted uh, Abrams, who was a polymath and a very talented artist in many ways, who was generally thought to be a genius by those who knew him. And there's wonderful stories about all these people, none of which I will share with you <laughs> because there's no time. Are there any questions? <laughs> the story of how this picture was unearthed is interesting. Uh, someone from the University of North Carolina saw it and thought, hmm, this must be about the time when Wolf was visiting in Seattle, which was only a few weeks before he died because he caught his infection here uh, that killed him. Uh, so this has a sad sort of understory to it. But uh, So they got in touch with uh, somebody here, and they figured it out with the help of the woman in the middle, Teresa, who sent the picture to Ivor, and uh, Ivor kept it in his desk thereafter forever. And he has some good – well, if you want to read about this, read the book. Okay, it's in the book. The book's not out yet, though. <laughs> All right. Uh, next picture is a, a couple of guys here that are the same guy. Uh, which is uh, the guy that uh, was on the waterfront for a long time. And being an old guy now, his name slips my mind. Huh. It's a sad thing of age. This kind of thing happens inc frequently and increasingly as you get older. It's not Fred Becky, but it's nearly that. So let's call him Fred. Uh, this guy was a marvelous character on the waterfront. Uh, he had a slip between his between Ivers Pier and the one to the north of it, which he called Beach Comer's Cove, and because he simply wanted it that way. When Ivor shut down his uh, aquarium in '56, he put a little jar of water with some barnacles in it and said, "The only aquarium on the on the waterfront," because he was sort of scolding Ivor for having turned down his. Uh, Ivor told a story about seeing him having an intense conversation at the side of the pier one evening when Ivor was going home about midnight uh, with a professor who was visiting town. They were talking about the solar system and about all sorts of interesting and deep things. And then Ivor came back to the acres around 7 o'clock and they were still in the same place talking about the solar system and all sorts of deep things. So this guy, Fred Becky, I'm sorry. This age thing is terrible. I would like you all to be, feel great sympathy for that, for all of us who lose our, our minds as we get over in the fading years. Is it happening to you too? Would you like to take over maybe? Your names will be just as good as mine. So this guy has also many good – well, here's another good story about this guy. Uh, he had a big place out near Carkeek. And it was full of all sorts of memorabilia. And he was a picker, so it was just full of all this junk, you know. But he was also a naturalist, and he was brilliant by everybody's description. And his naturalism is pointed out that when he was building a new brick chimney attached to, to his place, 
he came across a, a, a bird nest up underneath the eaves. So he, eaves. so he simply took the chimney and curved it around the bird nest. So his chimney had this, uh, this wonderful loop in it to avoid a bird's nest. Uh, he, another time women came to the, um, is my time up yet? Okay. Another time, uh, women came to the waterfront uh, and uh, with some jars. They were from the Midwest. And they asked that he, whether he could rig something to get them water from Elliott Bay because they wanted to take it back with them to the Midwest. And he did that. He got them some water and put threw the caps on. And the women thanked him profusely. And they walked away. And then he stopped them. And he said, uh, pardon me. I just thought of something. It's important that we do this. Let's take the caps off and pour a little water out because when the tide comes in, it's just going to knock the lids off. <laughs> and, and they were very thankful to him. They did that. They poured a little water off, screwed it back on, and took their water back to the Midwest, where it wasn't influenced by the tides at all. The moon had no effect on it back there. I'm so ashamed for not remembering his name. But the point is to have both pictures up here. <sighs> Becky. No, no, I'm sorry. Let's to have these two pictures up here is to have you vote on them because I can only use one of them in the book, all right? So I'm going to now do a vote among you people here to select which one goes in the boat, I think. Let's start with the one on the left and uh, let me now see what your vote is like. <clears throat> hold on, hold on. It'll, the name will come to me later and I'll let you know. Okay, the one on the left, if you prefer that one, please raise your hand high. Now the one on the right, please raise your hand high. Is it the right one that the more people? What do you think? I voted left. So. Yeah, well, you're biased. <laughs> put them down again. Let's do it. Left side, go ahead. Put it, wait a second. If you want the one on the left, put your left hand up. That'll make it really clear. All right. Oh, yeah, that's easier. All right. Now put them down. If you want the one on the right, put them up. Okay. So it's the one on the right that wins. Let's look at them. Well, I think the reason for that is probably because it's clear. It looks to be a picture that's in better shape. Let's imagine that they're both in the same shape, okay? Let's vote again. <laughs> All those who want the one on the left, now they're same, the same quality. Well, on the left, please raise your hands on the left. Uh, think of, have a little sympathy for this man. <laughs> All right, now the one on the right, uh, still wins. I'm sorry, you're gonna lose anyway, though. Because the one on the left is the one that's in the acres of clams, and it's the one that they pay, Ivor, they paid at 50 bucks every month to hang it. Because Ivor was of the opinion he wanted people to think that he was him, this guy, see? So when people came in there, they go, is that Ivor? And the, the, they said, yeah, that's Ivor. Because this is the heroic kind of waterfront guy that Ivor wanted to be like. So it, as a joke, he put it in their portrait and paid the guy 50 bucks, and the guy needed it. I mean, they, he wasn't a rich man. He was, a, he was a scrapper and a picker, and I think my time's up. All right. Okay. Um, I am going to talk about our Flickr site. Um, next slide. So we, on the Seattle Municipal Archives uh, webpage, we have a photo database that's got about 140,000 photos individually cataloged. Um, you know, it's a great re resource, except for people to use the resource, they need to know that we exist. And, you know, people in this room, probably a higher proportion of you know we exist, but in the larger world, you know, people don't know we exist. So we decided about three years ago to move some of our stuff over to Flickr, thinking that let's go to where the people already are who are interested in photography, who might like to know that this, we have these things that they don't already know about. Um, so one cool thing, there's a lot of neat things that we are doing on the Flickr site that we can't do with our photo database. And one of them is allowing for browsing. And so we have created these sets that you can see up here. Um, so we can arrange them in sort of topical uh, categories. So things like, you know, performing arts or uh, neighborhood scenes or um, we've started a set now in the Seattle World's Fair where we're starting to gather some of the resources we have there. So it makes for a better experience where you can just sort of say, oh, that topic sounds interesting and kind of browse around, which is not something you can do so much in a searchable database. So that's one thing that's been neat for us. Um, we can also highlight 
some things that don't fit in our photo database. So in here we've got a small set of postcards, and that's not something that we have online. We've also got a map set in here, which is kind of fun to browse through. And I think my favorite part is that we can put up things like ephemera. If we could do the next slide. Um, so kind of cool things like this. This is the city of Ballard liquor license, you know, back before Ballard was part of Seattle. And it's just a neat thing, and people really like to see it, but it's not something that fits in with our, um, in our databases online. We've got a lot of really cool graphics. Uh, just today I posted, there was a Parks Department um, modern dance poster, basically, with this crazy graphic, this huge, this woman dancing with this gigantic hair flowing all over the thing. You know, so things like that just don't have a home really within our photo database. So it's fun to be able to highlight some of those sorts of features. Uh, things like bumper stickers, and we put up the occasional uh, kid's letter to the mayor. There was someone who wrote to Mayor Ullman who was writing on Earth Day and saying, you know, how come you're not cleaning up the sound? Are you just drinking cocktails and eating, and why aren't you doing more? You know, things like that that are just sort of fun to see. Um, but I think the biggest plus for us in terms of starting our Flickr site has just been the, the community of users that we've um, sort of developed people have found us and they really, you know, look for our photos. We try and put um, one or two up pretty much every day, and so people who have us on an RSS feed or something always have something new to look at. Um, and we get a lot of repeat visitors, people commenting. Um, and it's been great because we get um, a lot of times extra information about things, things we didn't know. Um, a lot of times people say, oh, I recognize that guy. He was my swimming instructor at Green Lake, and here's his name. Or um, we have a picture of a policeman down on First Avenue. Somebody totally knew his name, knew how long he'd worked there. You know, that was his beat, that kind of stuff. So just added information is really cool. Sometimes we get corrected information. Um, so things where we say that it's, it's really 24th and 65th, and someone says, no, actually, that's 63rd. I can recognize, and they'll pull up a Google Street View and show that that's still the building, and we have the information wrong. So it's great that we can make corrections in our database. Um, but the coolest thing, I think, if you could do the next slide, um, are sometimes we have just basically no identification on a photo. This is one that the city engineers took to show off the awesome new um, light poles and wiring. And so that was the label on the photo was light poles and wiring. And Wait a second. I used to live here. <laughs> <laughs> I lived right in that building right there. <laughs> So you know where it is. Yeah, I know where it is, right down the street. Uh -huh. yep. In the mid-70s, I lived there, 75, 76, 77. <laughs> <laughs> it was handed down from Cornish students and teachers to, you know, down <laughs> So it was great. We just put that up on the site and said, anybody know where this is? And we had users, including Rob here, who use all kinds of clues. We zoomed in, and they found a number on the streetcar. And they went back to the old streetcar routes and figured out that that streetcar went down Broadway. And so this is probably on Broadway. And then they were looking at the angle of the street and how it kind of bends at the very end. It's hard to see there. Um, Rob, I believe, found a street clock, of course, on there and figured out what time it was and saw what po the shadows were pointing a certain way so he could tell that we were looking north. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And people had looked at the street. The yeah, it's at the end of the street. It is at the end of the street. Um, and uh, people looked at business names and tried to find out where those businesses were. Someone else recognized the belfry of the church that's down the street. So it was just, it's great for us. We can put things up and, and get information that we just wouldn't have otherwise and probably wouldn't have the time to research on our own. We had another one that just said beach, and it was this building on a beach, and it didn't look really familiar. We thought maybe it was an old Alki bathhouse or something. We put it up, and it turned out it was the English Bay bathhouse in Vancouver. <laughs> Why we have a photo of that, I have no idea, um, and we never would have worked that out, but the community of users really helped us out with that. So, um, one more thing. Yeah. From that second floor window, there was the, that was the kitchen. And looking over Broadway, I shot about 4,000 pictures of the bus stop. That's the bus stop on your website. That's right. Oh, wow. So i uh, got a real great, about two years. I'm taking your time now. I know, <laughs> so I have about two years of images of this one bus stop. And it's really informative of, you know, of the people that lived on the hill in, the, in those years. And it's, some of them is a great portrait, too, because the light was so beautiful for photography there. It bounced off the other side of the street, and it was just like a studio. All right, now. If you search for street photography on Paul Dorpat's website, you'll find that article with oh, yeah. like 100 of those photos. It's great. 
So overall, we've just been really happy with our experience there. We still have the detailed database with you know way more photos on our website, so people um, who know about us now through Flickr can come and find us and do research. And actually, just today, we had someone come in to do research in the archive because of something that he found on the website and was curious about. Um, but it's just been a great experience for us and kind of letting us reach some new people who didn't know we existed before. So. Hello. Hey. Is that me? Okay, great. So um, Paul got his start like 40 years ago, as far as I can tell from the Seattle Times archives, by looking in the Seattle Municipal Archives, the UW, Digital, the UW Special Collections archives, and other um, photo collections, just digging through all the photos and getting familiar with them. About 43 years ago I started, yeah. So um, I am a different generation, so I got my start by digging through digital collections. and. This was one of the first photos that got me interested. I don't know if you can really tell in black, in, or in the red here, it's, uh, the top is supposed to be black and white, bottom is supposed to be color. This was in the, um, I believe, New York Public Library's collection on Flickr, and it just said, um, <coughs> photo of Japan, 1880s. And I went and dug through um, a database of, archive, of uh, Japanese photos online and figured out exactly where it was taken and happened to, happened to coincidentally be going to Japan and went and took the exact same spot, which is down below. So up above, you've got um, cherry trees and a path leading with, uh, with you know, you know the, uh, the rickshaws, exactly. Down below, it's you know elevated freeway, about 10 lanes of freeway down below. You can't tell there's a tunnel going below us and there's a subway down there as well. So totally different environment. But I, I, I want to, um, little, little um, asterisks here. The top one is absolutely not natural. So don't get tricked into saying, what did we do to the natural environment? The top one was 100% false, like the cherry trees were planted. The water was a moat that was filled in by a river. So don't get tricked into thinking we destroyed the environment. Tokyo has always been unnatural. OK, so this is how I, this is how I got my start, was this is the absolute first uh, reef photography I ever did. Um, uh, uh, very influenced by Paul Dorpat, but it was in Tokyo. So then the, uh, the next one I've got here is um, actually one of the most recent ones I've done. The top photo is taken, I figured out the date based on the fact that there's only one statue, but this is Union, Union Station in Washington, D.C. Um, this was taken by my great-grandfather in 1908, about January of 1908, because there's another photo that shows a title basin all frozen over. And I was there for um, my graduation ceremonies in May and uh, took the bottom photo. I was almost dead from the flu, but managed to take the train there because I had to take that photo. Um, yeah, so this is the second one I wanted to show you. This was my great-grandfather's photo, and this is what I'm doing now. I don't have a lot of his photos, but I'm going around trying to take all of them. And one of them, you mentioned, uh, English Bay. Um, I was flipping through his photos, and I said, I've seen that photo before. It's almost exactly the same angle as the uh, Seattle Municipal Archives photo that they've posted to Flickr. So just looking through the photos, a place that I've never looked at English Bay from that angle, but because I've seen it in the Flickr, in the Flickr stream of the Seattle Municipal Archives, I was able to recognize this, this beach. That's it for the second one. Let's see what the third one is. Right, so Alki, I did have it in there. So this was, I, I spend most of my time, because they have the best collection of Seattle photos by far in the Seattle Municipal Archives um, Flickr stream. There is stuff that the Seattle Public Library has posted on their website, and uh, the UW Digital Collections has posted some very low-resolution photos to Flickr, but the Municipal Archives has these great high-res photos that you can do. So this one is one that I ran in. Here, yeah, Municipal Archives. Because really, if you don't have them high definition, you can't zoom in and see the number on the streetcar, and you can't do anything to help them. It's like, why are you posting it to the web if I can't help you by figuring out more information than you've already got, right? Both sharing it and guarding it. Mistake. <laughs> Sharing and guarding, yeah, right, trying to hold on to the money of it, right? Anyway, so this is Alki Beach, and I wanted to show this photo. It's not a particularly wonderful, extremely great photo. It's not opening day, but this photo is important to me because I looked at this, and when I was going to try and figure out about opening day for Alki, I ran across a, t a bunch of really interesting stuff in the 1911, which is when it opened, uh, Seattle Times, Seattle Star, Seattle PI. It got me really thinking hard about, um, about what what the situation for racism was, or like what was race about in Seattle in 1911, because um, there was an there was a, uh, a what do you call them, a political cartoon, a caricature 
of Jack Johnson and, uh, and uh, the next guy that was supposed to take on Jack Johnson. Actually, it was just a white guy. It was just a random white guy. And Jack Johnson is this big, goofy-looking black guy, you know, huge, goofy-looking with the monocle and big lips and everything. And the white guy is really strong but tiny. Like, you know, he's not going to be able to take him on. And I was like, that is the most racist thing I've seen in a paper, because I don't look at old papers that often. That's the most racist thing I've seen in a long time. And then from there, I was just digging around just the same, art, the same days, just within a couple days, and found an article um, about, it says, uh, black, uh, Negro to marry white woman. That's the headline of this front page, front page article in the 1911, I believe it was Seattle Star. And uh, researching that has led me to the tour that I'll be doing next month for, uh, for Mohai. Uh, we're going to be walking on First Hill from the place that they were rejected. Their wedding license was rejected by the King County. Well, they got the license. Their um, wedding ceremony was rejected by, at the King County Courthouse. The judges refused to put it on. So they walked across First Hill to the first AME church, past lots of other churches and cathedrals, and finally got married at the, at the African American church um, over on 14th and Union. So we'll be kind of walking along and thinking about what 1911 was like and whether they might have seen some bear, cub, bear cubs being walked or, or uh, what else they might have seen on First Hill. And that's all I have for my three. Ho hopefully it was under five minutes. Well, um, my field is um, fine art photography um, here in the Northwest, primarily Washington State. And um, I just published, uh, was the um, major author of um, a book on the Seattle Camera Club. And the Seattle Camera Club was a, a group uh, that was started in 1924 by uh, 38 Japanese uh, immigrants that lived here in Seattle. And they, um, they got together and formed this club, and it was first um, the the first exhibition that they had was local. It included just local uh, artists, lo local photographers, and then it expanded so rapidly that they became an international uh, club, and their their uh, reputation grew immensely over the next couple of years. In fact, it grew so so much that um, by the uh, around 1927. They were uh, seven of the ten most exhibited pictorial photographers in the entire world were members of the Seattle Camera Club. Now, this whole history, I started researching this over 20 years ago, and the, the first thing that I noticed is that this fine art photography was uh, not in any of the local museums. It was held in, primarily in libraries at the uh, University of Washington Special Collections and at the uh, Seattle Public Library, uh, but there weren't any examples of it in the um, in, in any museums, the Seattle uh, Art Museum or any of the other uh, local in art institutions. And so I, uh, after I was researching it, I found that um, some of the problems that I came across, um, and, and again, I wanted to explain that I was researching this before the internet. So if you ever want to have a real challenge, <laughs> don't use the internet to do some of this research on obscure people. But this first image uh, was done by a, a man named Dwayne Alby. And Wayne Alby was um, a local photographer. He started in Tacoma, but then moved into Seattle in 1914. And um, he actually started his uh, studio and a woman named Ella McBride, who were both, they were both very, very successful. Their studios were right in this neighborhood. In fact, Ella McBride's studio was right there across the street in the Loveless building where the uh, massage business is right there. So this is, you can see this is not um, intentionally uh, blurred uh, because of a bad photograph. The, uh, the photo is of the uh, train station downtown. And um, it's, these fine art photographers were trying to mimic paintings. So they were trying to imitate uh, impressionism, basically, impressionistic paintings. So you'll see that the, the, the work of a lot of the pictorial, the early pictorialists, was, were deliberately blurred or they were uh, the, the um, negatives or in the photo prints were um, manipulated very heavily. So you, you get basically an idea of the subject, but it's their impression of it. So, and again, this was the beginning stages of art being accepted as a fine art. So you wanna switch to the next one? Now you all recognize the pergola in Pioneer Square. And I actually brought, I brought some of these photos too, if you'd like to see some of them, I brought this one. And you could, this was, um, uh, made around 1918 to 1920. And if you look at the, the image of it, 
the, the, uh, the, the work was done by Frank Kunishige. He was one of the Japanese immigrants that worked here and became extremely well known internationally. And the, um, the work you can see, it's, it was manipulated very heavily to give the appearance of a, a charcoal drawing or a, um, a maybe an etching or something. Uh, but if you look at these, sometimes people say, well, I can take really good photos, too, with my camera. And how come they're, you know, why are these people considered artists? Well, if you look at the photos in person, you, you'll see why. You want to go to the next one? Now, one of the uh, interesting um, aspects that when I was researching the book on the Seattle Camera Club, I found a lot of different side interests that c all connected to the photography and to the photographers. I mentioned Ella McBride. She was the uh, manager for, have you heard of Edward Curtis? He was th probably the most famous early photographer here in Seattle. She was his um, manager. She was the manager of his studio, but broke away and opened her own studio in 1917 with Wayne Albee. And um, she got associated with Cornish right up the street and she began photographing, um, her and her assistants became um, known for their dance photographs. And this is a very early uh, image of Martha Graham taken by her assistant, Soichi Tsunami. Mr. Tsunami left Seattle in uh, the mid-1920s. He moved to New York to study painting and sculpture, and he started photographing works of art for his friends, his painter friends, and he, his work was noticed by uh, a woman that, uh, opened a very important art museum and uh, the Museum of Modern Art and he became their staff photographer for um, from the time it opened until he passed away in the 1970s and he created the probably the largest body of work for uh, with the dance theme in the country and it's housed primarily in the New York Public Library so all of the work that um, it all originated here and then it spread to New York and um, became very very famous well, thanks very much for having me here, uh, Bo, and everyone on, on this panel. It's really, I'm pretty lucky to be a part of it. Uh, my name is Casey McNerthy, and I'm a reporter at the Seattle PI. And I'm going to take you through a few of my favorite PI photos and a few quirky stories of why I, I chose them. Um, one of the things, like Julie was saying, with the municipal archives is that as the Internet has developed, we've, we've had um, a lot more opportunities to allow uh, some photos that have been sitting in the PI's archives for decades, uh, sometimes unseen for decades, uh, to put them up for other people to see and, and kind of give their input on. Um, it, it's been really fun. It's been so fascinating to go down and see all this history. Um, the interesting thing is is there's a, a lot of quirky finds in, in interesting places, um, like this one. This was, was one that I, I found in uh, early 2008, and it was – in uh, the way that the the PI photo archive is, it was saved is they would save uh, the photos based off of the location and then the name. And so there's a lot of folders that say Seattle and then the type of business like uh, Seattle restaurant or uh, Seattle auto repair. Um, and then the name would follow that. And then the same for, for Bothell or uh, North Bend or other cities like that, whatever, it, or, or Everett, uh, Tacoma. And this one uh, was a great shot uh, that was in the folder that was Seattle uh, traffic lights. You know, and, and there's this, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of quirky. And um, it, this was actually, I think this was, was, was part of where I was stuck in traffic on the way up here. But what was really neat about this when I, when I saw it is uh, the first thing that I noticed was that was the first location of the doghouse there. If, if you look real, real close, Bob Murray's doghouse, which moved – I'm, I'm sure Paul would know when exactly it, it moved from that location where it first was to what's now the Hurricane Cafe and then closed in, in, in the early 90s. You guys must remember the doghouse open all night, you know. Um, and so I, 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 I saw this, and when uh, we first uncovered it after all these years and, and it was kind of in this obscure folder, I was like, oh, we got to put this up. People will know where this is, you know. But it, it's, it's interesting um, that – People, when they took it for the PI and when it ran, there, uh, there's all these marks on the photograph to show the traffic lights. And there, there was never kind of the, the forward thinking that, you know, we should save this because decades from now there might be the Internet and people would want to see it. But it, it, it's still fascinating to kind of find these little gems that you see and are, you know, kind of capture the city before it uh, got much bigger. And you, you notice that area up there, there's no 
no I five and there's and that area where the doghouse now is a a condominium that was built in early two thousand seven. I'm I, I might be rambling, so if I am, somebody please uh, you know wave me down because my friends will tell you I I do that from time to time. Uh, but we can go on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, here's another one that's uh, pretty good. Um, this one on the bottom was another one that I found uh, that was uh, located in the oversized file. Um, there's there's um, hundreds of thousands of, of photos that are in the PI archive, and um, in the last year we've we've scanned uh, about. 10 to 12,000 of them, and we've got great interns and, and some staff members who are really working hard to, to keep preserving those and, and then also making them available on the website. Um, and we've been doing a lot of galleries, some certainly inspired by Paul's now and then. The one on the bottom is uh, a, a great fight that was in the folder for Civic Field, which is where Memorial Stadium is now. That's the Al Hostack and Freddie Steele fight in the summer of 1938 where um, – Al Hostack, a guy that went to Cleveland High School and grew up around Georgetown, um, fought Tacoma's uh, Freddie Steele, and it was this huge, massive cr crowd. He won the middleweight title then, and uh, there's there's a great story to that. Um, I, I could continue about it, but um, it, it's it's neat to see how when we had the newspaper, one.